This video is a review of the harmonic oscillator in quantum mechanics. So we start with the classical harmonic oscillator where we have a potential energy function which is defined as one half of some constant k times our position variable x which is squared. So the force you get from this is the minus derivative with respect to x which is minus kx. And if you solve for the trajectory over time for a particle which obeys this potential, you'll get that that trajectory over time is some amplitude A times a cosine times some angular frequency times time. So it's oscillatory back and forth in time. The particle just goes up and down the well back and forth. And the energy is conserved over time, and it's constant, and it's just equal to one half of the spring constant K <clears throat> times the maximum amplitude A squared. So when we want to build a model for the harmonic oscillator in quantum mechanics, the problem we're applying this to is the problem of a vibrating diatomic molecule. So vibrating diatomic molecules have some potential which is repulsive at short range when the, molecule, when the two atoms are very close, and it also gets uh, higher in energy at long range when the atoms are farther away from each other, tending towards some zero at infinite separation. And this has two atoms, each of which have some mass, m1 and m2. They're connected by some spring with a spring constant k, which obeys the same harmonic oscillator uh, potential there. And there's some distance apart r, which defines our potential. There's some minimum energy here on the potential r0. And then we just approximate this with a second order Taylor series, giving us this potential, defining our spatial position as this x, which is the difference between the position of the two atoms, their distance from each other, relative to their ideal or minimum energy displacement. The mass that we're going to need to use for the system is not the mass of either particle, but it's the reduced mass of the system, which is the product of the two masses divided by their sum. And that has uh, different, different forms for what the cases are, whether uh, mass 2 or mass 1 is much larger than the other, or whether they're the same. Then when we want to solve the system at a quantum, quantum mechanical level, we need to define a Hamiltonian. So we have our kinetic energy term, minus h bar squared over 2 mu, times second derivative with respect to position, plus 1 half kx squared, our potential energy term. And when we solve h psi equals e psi, the Schrodinger equation for this, we get that our energy levels <clears throat> end up being evenly spaced. We have Planck's constant times the frequency, times an integer n, which starts at 0 and goes up, times n plus 1 half. So it's e equals h nu times n plus 1 half. And this is also equivalent to h bar times omega, the angular frequency, times n plus 1 half. Each of these is the same within a factor of uh, 2 pi. And this angular frequency omega is the spring constant k divided by the reduced mass and then their square root. So you can see how that depends on both the stiffness of the spring and the masses of the particles. And then similarly, the frequency relative to the angular frequency is just a factor of two pi away. So using this model system and these energy levels, we can model the infrared spectra of diatomic molecules, their vibrational spectrum. So we have our ground state at n equals zero, which most molecules exist in at room temperature because these energy levels are quite far spaced apart. So that energy is one half h nu. And at n equals one, we have an energy of three halves h nu. Our selection rule for infrared spectra, for vibrational spectra, is that the change in our vibrational quantum number n is going to be plus or minus one, plus one for absorption of a photon, minus one for emission of a photon. And the change in energy between these two levels is going to be Planck's constant times the frequency. It's going to be h nu, where our nu is defined by this equation here. So it doesn't matter which energy levels you're transitioning between. All of the transitions are equal in energy, and that is a, a true of all harmonic oscillators. When we want to go beyond uh, just standard perfectly harmonic oscillators, we want to include higher order terms. We see that the molecular potential energy surface isn't exactly harmonic. At short range, it gets much stiffer, and at long range, it gets much softer. So we have additional terms in the Taylor series which we could append onto our potential energy. And we can use a technique which we'll describe later called perturbation theory to get a higher order correction beyond this to see what it does to the energy levels. 
What this ends up doing is pushing our higher energy levels uh, closer together, and the result of this is that we have this anharmonicity constant here, which is hopefully much, much less than one for a perfectly harmonic oscillator at zero. And it tends to push these uh, energy levels a little bit closer together and make these changes in energy smaller uh, as you go higher and higher up because the potential is becoming less and less bound. For the wave functions of the harmonic oscillator, we have a wave function for each individual energy level, which depends on a normalization constant n, which unlike the particle in a box, now changes form at each different quantum number. We have a polynomial called the Hermite polynomials, which obey a certain law for how they're described. And the function that you plug into the Hermite polynomials is not just x, it's the square root of this thing called alpha times x. And then the last part of it is a Gaussian function e to the minus alpha x squared over 2, just the standard bell curve type function. And our alpha here, which appears in the polynomials and the Gaussian, is determined by the square root of our spring constant times reduced mass divided by h bar Planck's constant. So it depends on those three quantities there. Um, because of the structure of these wave functions here, what comes up a lot in terms of the harmonic oscillator are even and odd functions because the harmonic oscillator wave functions will either be perfectly even or perfectly odd. And this is important because it can simplify a lot of the integrals that we need to do to calculate properties, normalizations, expectation values, those sorts of things. And the integral from minus infinity to infinity of an even function is twice the integral from zero to infinity because it's symmetric on both sides, on, on x being negative and x being positive. Whereas for an odd function, we have the integral from minus infinity to infinity of an odd function is going to be zero because the two sides are mirror images of each other. They're opposites and therefore they cancel out perfectly. When we want to extend the harmonic oscillator into three dimensions, we have a potential energy which is just harmonic in each dimension. We have a spring constant, kx, ky, or kz in each dimension. And then the potential is again quadratic with respect to each coordinate, x squared, y squared, and z squared. And what we can do is separation of variables. And we end up with an energy that, determ that depends on these three quantum numbers, one for each spatial dimension. We'll see we always have one quantum number for every spatial dimension when we're talking about certain wave functions. We have nx, ny, and nz. And if the three spring constants are equal to each other, we can make the simplification that the energy is just equal to h nu, some vibrational frequency, times nx plus ny plus nz plus three halves, just the sum, uh, the generalized sum of three of these individual terms here. Then moving that to polyatomic vibrations, if we have some polyatomic molecule with n atoms, there are three n minus six uh, vibrational modes if, the, if it is nonlinear. And if it's linear, there are three n minus five. And it works basically the same way, but you work in terms of things called normal coordinates, which we discuss in that video. Uh, and you basically have a potential energy which determines which depends on those normal coordinates uh, which in the same kind of way instead of one half kx squared we have one half this uh, element called a hessian element which is an effective spring constant times the displacement from that normal mode squared and then you end up uh, with similarly with a sep a uh, situation which has separation of variables where the energy is just a sum over those three n minus six uh, vibrational coordinates where we have a free vibrational frequency for each coordinate and quantum number for each of them. Uh, just a generalized sum of this type of term here again. Again with these set of quantum numbers starting with zero anytime we're talking about a harmonic oscillator.